thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the use of optical methods in human neuroscience, uh, the current challenges and the recent advances uh, and future of these me methods. Uh, while my talk includes optical and photoacoustics, uh, let me use FNIRS in the same way uh, as fMRI covers many different uh, magnetic resonance imaging modalities. So, uh, because of the low absorption, near infrared light can pass uh, the skull and reach the brain. But because of the high scattering, it is highly diffused. Still, uh, it can be used to measure brain activity by quantifying changes of oxygen the oxymoglobin concentration that are the main tissue chromophore in this spectral region. So, um, FNIRS started about 30 years ago. And uh, here I'm reporting the number of publications per year. And uh, you can see in the last uh, 10 years, there has been a, a large increase in publication. And this is due to the user adoption of this uh, technology. And um, with the advent of the FNIR Society that we founded in 2012, uh, we, uh, we facilitate interaction between user and developers. Uh, and the society has just published a paper to set the guideline for FNIR experiments and data analysis, how to report them in a more consistent way. So why there is uh, this growing number of users and papers uh, is because the technology is safe, low cost, easy to use, motion compatible, and mostly portable. So we have moved away from the cumbersome and heavy fiber optics and replaced them with lightweight wearable system, which allow to study brain function in natural settings. So we can do measurements out, outside the lab while walking and interacting with people and things and image the brain during this interaction. Uh, with average scanning, we can study the synchronicity of two brain while two person talk or play music together, like in here. And uh, we, we are able to study how the brain learn while it's learning. In this case, how this person is learning to make a difficult turn. Or how the infant brain responds to stimuli and how they uh, deviate when growing in low socioeconomic settings. So uh, while all this is great, um, we know we can do better. So image quality and spatial resolution, depth sensitivity are all limitations that we are constantly addressing. So when FNI started, uh, we adjusted one source and one detector, and we can show any hemoglobin changes that resemble the shapes of the ball signal. Um, we then quickly moved to an array of source and detectors, and, uh, and uh, we, and then, and that could generate uh, 2D maps of activities. Um, by adding uh, overlapping source detector channels, we were able to render some 3D reconstruction. And finally, uh, moving to dense array allow us to achieve a spatial resolution similar to the one of fMRI. Uh, and here you can see the um, high density uh, FNIRS uh, activations very um, resemble the one of fMRI. And most recently, um, this beautiful visual activation decoding images have been published with the high density system. High density not only improve image quality, but also increase brain sensitivity, reduce motion artifact, and increase reproducibility. Uh, the problem, uh, high density comes with a price, not just more expensive, but also more engineering challenging. We did either many fiber, like you saw in the Sanders picture before, or with a lot of wires that need to be managed. Uh, with the right amount of investment, uh, the technology can be miniaturized, and just recently, Kernel unveiled uh, this new NIRS this device, this beautiful helmet uh, with more than 1,000 channels and amazing specs. So for example, has an amazing SNR, uh, acquire acquisition rate very fast, and all the power and data transmission is done through a simple USB cable. 
This has been possible because kernel has developed their own sources, their own spot detector, and all the in integrated all the electronics uh, needed uh, in a single chip. Uh, the, um, and not only that, the kernel system, uh, it doesn't use continuous wave nears, so it doesn't just measure light attenuation. Uh, he had some feature and it worked in the time domain, which means that uh, it sends a pulse of light, very narrow, because seconds uh, uh, times, and uh, it detects uh, the, time, uh, the arrival time of the photons so that it can distinguish the photons that have traveled uh, only in the scalp and arrive early to the detector versus the one that have walked uh, through deeper tissue and carry information ab about the brain. Uh, and uh, this video here is the prefrontal activation during a memory task with the with a VR. Uh, we can measure many other features of the light. Uh, for example, if we add the wavelength, so if we add color, and we measure the attenuation at all the color, we can do spectroscopy and measure water, but also measure cytochrome C oxidase that uh, is related to cell metabolism and I offer a more direct measure of neural activity in the vascular hemoglobin changes, like as shown here, that you can see activation only in a larger separation, so more sensitive to the brain, while vascular is mixed up with some physiological heart rate increases and something like that. Problem of cytochrome C oxidase is that the concentration in tissue is very low respect to hemoglobin changes. So you need dedicated device and dedicated algorithm to be able to separate the, these two components. Uh, another technology uh, that is rapidly growing is diffuse correction spectroscopy. This method measures blood flow by quantifying the speckled fluctuation via uh, an autocorrelation function. And if I combine DCS with NIRS, uh, I can measure uh, CMRO2, oxygen metabolism, and that again is a more direct measure of brain activity. And uh, an example here, we have recently used DCS to show the efficacy of a new supplement in uh, enhancing cognitive performance in, in uh, kids uh, malnourished in Africa. Uh, here we were in Guinea-Bissau. And uh, so uh, this yes is great, but has some technical problem that need to be addressed. Uh, at the moment, uh, devices have only a few channels. Um, because you have to detect single speckle, there is a very low SNR that limits uh, depth sensitivity and acquisition rate. And unfortunately, you have to acquire fast because the pulse dial flow is, is super large. So if you acquire slow, you cannot filter properly this uh, uh, pulsation. And uh, the last few here, there have been many ways to improve uh, this, yes. For example, uh, a simple way is to increase uh, the number of detectors. And uh, the SNR gain is um, proportional at the square root of the number of detectors you use. So Facebook uh, here showed that using a 32 by 32 SPAD increased the, uh, the detection efficiency, the SNR of um, thir more than 30 times. In a more realistic situation in human at the right source detector separation, we have shown that uh, moving uh, uh, DCS to 1064 nanometer and using a really special detector like superconducting nanowire detector, we can increase uh, the number of photons we acquire uh, around uh, 12, 12, 12 times, and uh, the SNR gain can go up to 15 times. We have also shown that uh, we can move to time domain. Uh, like NIRS. And in this case, by looking at the late arriving photon, we can increase the depth sensitivity. And a few years ago, um, Vivac has introduced uh, heterodyne interferometric uh, uh, DCS. Uh, this interferometric method allows you to get a better SNR if you increase the power in the reference arm. And, and this way, you boost the signal. 
uh, interferometric will be really useful if you start to mix uh, uh, optics uh, with um, ultrasound. In particular, acoustic optic uh, near imaging, uh, it uses uh, um, a coherent light, uh, like in this yes, and, um, and then uh, focus ultrasound shift uh, the color uh, of the light. And uh, you want to detect the tact photon uh, targeted in this small area, and you can do that with an interferometer uh, at the same frequency of this shift. And um, so we just demonstrated with this yes that uh, um, sending an acoustic signal modulate uh, the autocorrelation function. And if you just look at the envelope, if you have uh, enough SNR to look at just that, uh, you can see that uh, the, uh, that envelope of the oscillation uh, give you the same blood flow that you were getting with the regular DCS. Um, so let me stay in acoustic optics. Um, you can add the holography instead of interferometry to acoustic optic to uh, increase your image resolution. And this is what uh, Mary Lou Jepsen and Open, wa wa Open Water are doing. So how do they work? So they send the light uh, and they send the ultrasound, the light uh, under the detector change color. And uh, to make an hologram, you need two, two beams of the same color. So they send a beam of light of the same color that of the frequency shift that the, and, uh, and they can make an hologram. And then they scan the whole area and reconstruct the image. You can do that only if you develop a very special uh, um, component uh, detector, ultrasonic chips, and lasers. And, um, and they're making progress. And here are from the website some of their uh, images in small animals. So they, they are getting really nice structural images. Finally, uh, photoacoustic computer tomography. Uh, you can send when you send light, uh, and the light gets absorbed. It, it, it emits an acoustic wave. Uh, this is a broadband acoustic wave, so he has a higher frequency, and more difficult to detect, but still uh, uh, through the skull, but uh, still uh, uh, better than is not scattered uh, like. Uh, if you were detecting light, you, you uh, um, detect now an acoustic wave uh, with um, the uh, 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 transducers. And if you have an array them, you can do an image. And it, this method worked really, really well in animal, in small animal. And you can see here the intact mouse brain, and you can do some uh, um, resting state connectivity. And you can also inject. Uh, something to create a seizures and you can see the wave uh, propagation of the seizures most recently this technology has been uh, applied in human uh, in the breast here to detect breast cancer and uh, you get a very high contrast uh, in the cancer area uh, the problem going to the to the brain uh, human brain is that you have to overcome these uh, aberrations uh, at the high frequency ultrasound and uh, and i'm looking forward uh, to see the progress because this will give the highest depth sensitivity and the highest of the solution of all the method that i listed up to now so uh, to recap there are several advantages of using optical methods to study the human brain there is still a lot of improvement that can be achieved and uh, and this improvement need to be made available to users to see uh, things actually grow and um, and to make these technical uh, advances uh, is really key the development of ad hoc uh, components. Uh, they can be detector light sources or integrated chips to keep the uh, cost low and the wearability and portability. Uh, thank you so much for listening.